All right, so I am so excited to have my guest today, who is Landon Coles, who is actually my god brother. Indeed. And, <laughs> <laughs> but um, special, special, special guest to have you here um, and, and really talk about the importance of leaving a rich legacy. So like I was telling you a little bit earlier, you know, this podcast is an opportunity to talk about conversations we don't often have in the Black and Brown community. And I consider this to be a love letter to my younger self because right. as I went through my healing journey, there were so many things that I realized that I just never talked about with my parents, my friends, right. coworkers. And this podcast is an opportunity to have those conversations and really set up the next generation for success. And that also includes you because right. you're 22 and you yeah. are doing some amazing work and things that I wish I would have known and done at that age. So right. you are so ahead of the game. Whew. You are. You are. Well, you're I'm, ahead of I'm, the game. I'm ahead of the game because I had people who prayed and poured into mm. me and pushed me and nourished me to be where I'm able to be at at 22. So you never get here in isolation. So I can only take as much credit as for the individuals, the strong, especially strong Black women who pushed me and helped to raise me, including your mom, my godmother, uh, <laughs> who was equally instrumental in that as well. So I, it, I give all the credit to them and to God. Oh, yes. Come on, <laughs> Start us off. But um, yes, I am excited because like I told you, you are my youngest guest. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm hoping that truly you will be able to inspire others who are not only around your age range, but yeah. you know, can be my age or older. It's never too early and it's never too late to start your healing right. journey or work on yourself. Right. So Landon, tell us just a little bit about you. Who was Landon? Who was Landon? Um, so Landon Coles, um, I am a brother. Um, I am a son. I am a member of a big family, an extended family and of an extended network. I'm a member of a praying family. So I grew up, born in South Florida, grew up in Tallahassee um, to two just amazing parents. Um, mom with the family, you dad with the Florida State divided house. Um, grew up in Tallahassee as a country boy. So throughout the conversations, you know, some people probably hear the twang a little bit. Um, and then, you know, just coming up, I was always endowed with a very strong sense of faith. The, the belief that you could be anything you want to be in this world with faith in God and, and, and a hardworking attitude. And that no matter where it is, we're not going to stop you. We're going to support you. And so for me, the sky has always been the limit. And then you push beyond that even when you do get there. Um, so for me, like the White House is my goal one day. And I know that I'll make it there. Um, and that's without shadow of a doubt. Um, always been an exceptionally involved student, um, someone who valued education to a great degree um, and valued what I could contribute while being in the classroom as well. So how is it that I empower others? And I've always found a knack for speaking. You know, this mouth coming up got me in trouble a lot until you learn how to hone your gift and to use it for good. So you know, like I started using, I started getting involved with a lot of clubs and extracurricular activities. I was president of this and president of that. And I had so many cords around my neck when I graduated from high school. I then was fortunate enough and blessed enough to receive a full academic scholarship to the University of Miami. Um, I accepted gladly um, because we follow wherever the money may be at. And I went down there and took campus by storm, hence why I always have to represent in some way, shape or form my alma mater. Got involved from day one and was making a name for myself. I graduated as the student government president and the student trustee on the University of Miami's board of trustees last year. Um, graduated debt free, so zero dollars in debt with a degree worth a quarter of a million dollars. Um, you know, and then I hit what I think a lot of students hit, even the ones that got it together, the sort of little rough patch of life. I made a very critical decision my senior year not to go straight through the law school like I had always envisioned I would. And the question then becomes, what do you do with yourself when life is not going how you planned it to be? Um, and it was life's detour. I interned with USA Today last summer, fully remote. And I recognized that that was not the path that I wanted to take. But God truly does work in mysterious ways because 
being so involved in undergrad, I mean, I had a lot of eyes on me at all times. And I actually had a chance to meet an executive for the company that I work for now. She's the senior vice president and chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer for all of the Estee Lauder companies. She saw me doing my thing on campus, plucked me up. And by the end of the summer, as soon as my internship ended, my internship ended on a Friday, I had the job offer that Monday. Um, and I started working for the Estee Lauder companies. Uh, so the the beauty conglomerate. I work for the global communications team doing communications surrounding our climate initiatives and our overall global supply chain. Wow. Woo, come on. <laughs> you know what? I just have to, as you were speaking, mm -hmm. I love that you started off with who you who you are yeah. outside of your scholastic achievements. And the yeah. reason why is because I feel like sometimes we get so caught up in just that lane that we mm -hmm. forget that we're we're someone else outside of out of what you've accomplished scholastically or your work and your career. There's so much more to you. And some people kind of put themselves in this lane where they limit what they can offer and yeah. what they can do because yeah. that's all they know. Now, yeah. now some of us were raised that way, right? Like yeah. you got to go to school, you got to do this, you got to have this career. And it kind of sometimes just puts you in a box. So I love that you started with that yeah. because that shows that you know that you're more than that. You you know, we, we accomplish so much more out of life outside of just exactly. a degree and exactly. work. So that's awesome. And I, and well, and, and to that point, right? Like I had to, the, this detour of life was not always appreciated at first. When life kind of hit and, you know, it was clear that I wasn't going straight to the law school, I felt like a failure at first. Especially in the generation that I'm growing up in, there's so much pressure placed on us to be exceptional, especially as a Black man at a PWI where there are so few of me's doing the things that I was doing. Um, you know, so all that to be said, as soon as I was not, I didn't have a title conferred next to my name, self-worth started to, to come into doubt, started mm -hmm. to come into question. Am I worthy? Did I push myself hard enough? Am I smart enough? And that has been a part of the self-love and self-healing journey over this last year that I'm very grateful again to God that he forced me to take this, this journey, this time off away from school to figure out who is Landon when he's not calling himself the president or a student or a scholar or the so many titles that I've always constantly attached myself to. And, you know, the one thing that I've come to realize, and I used to say this all the time in undergrad, when I first got on campus, Day one, University of Miami, and my girlfriend can tell you this, I told every individual whom I knew, I say, I'm going to be president of your campus by senior year. And I said that never as an, in a, a, never in an arrogant way, but in a way that I was confident of who I was. There's a difference between confidence and arrogance. I was always confident in what I knew I brought to the table. And I told people, I said, even if I don't win, I'll still be a president. I say, because at the end of the day, the title never made me presidential. I've always been that on my own. I brought all of the added value to the title itself. So for me, that mindset had still carried over to where no title has ever made me. And it took a while to get that in this journey of figuring out who I am post-undergrad before going back to school. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And I'm learning a lot about that. I make the title and never made me. Mm, that's good. Yes, that's very good. <laughs> and it's so good to realize it. Yeah. At your age, um, because, you know, some of us are figuring it out at yeah. 36 and 40 and 50. Um, and it's going to help you with so many things to yeah. enjoy life in the yeah. moments of life and kind of be flexible when the seasons change or what you thought was the plan. Yeah. And, and, and being led by that. So you talked about your, your, your self-love and, and mm -hmm. healing journey. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Like, how did you get there? Woo. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things of where I didn't even realize that I was on it until it just dawned upon me one day like an epiphany. Um, you know, in terms of I recognized for a while that I was in this place where I am very good at pretending like I got it all together on the outside, but then you're beating yourself up on the inside. Constant and 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 one of the things that I know that I'm most guilty of, especially occupying the spaces that I have doing all the exceptional things that I did in undergrad, I am constantly always comparing myself to what the next student has and what they're doing. Mm. I had several members, people who I appointed to be on my executive board in student government who were going straight through to Harvard and Columbia and the London School of Economics and Political Science, like friends who were doing some amazing stuff scholastically. 
And I felt as though because I was taking time off that that made me lesser than or inferior to. So all the sort of internalized self-hatred, self-anger, you know, what? why couldn't I have done it? Why didn't I push myself harder? You should have studied for the LSAT and whatever little spare time you had, you know, all these things. And I recognized one day that I was like, you're unhappy with yourself and you cannot truly find peace and appreciate the blessing that is in front of you because what I am doing I didn't turn out too bad. I work for a Fortune 500 company in New York for, for and, and right in front of Central Park, mind you, fresh out of college. This is my first full-time job in corporate America. I think I did pretty good for 22 years young. And, and again, you can't appreciate all of the phenomenal blessings that are right in front of you, all of the great networking opportunities, being a place like New York, because you're so busy looking backwards and looking at what other people have for themselves, not realizing that your journey is individual, that there is so much that you can appreciate in this time and in this season of life. And so for me, it just hit me one day that Landon, you're not about to sit around here and, and be in this pretty apartment that you and your girlfriend moved to on your own. You're not going to go to work every day at this beautiful job and not be able to appreciate it because you're so focused on other things. So it was really just kind of a moment of self-inflection and self-reflection to say, yeah, no, I want to enjoy this period of my life because you don't get this time back. I want to appreciate who I am and what I've accomplished by itself without comparing myself to what other people are doing. So it definitely was kind of like that, what the thief of joy is comparison. So removing myself out of that and just focusing much more inwardly on a day to day. And it wasn't something that happened overnight, right? It was something that started day by day by just saying, Landon, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to choose happiness. I'm going to choose joy and I'm going to choose peace actively, not passively today and expect it just to fall in my lap. I'm going to exercise that in my overall mentality. I'm going to choose to do that and just appreciating the little things, you know what I'm saying? So all that to be said, it, it, was a, it was a very progressive and gradual journey. And I'm still on it every single day, learning to just appreciate the little joys in life that I've earned or that I've worked for, for this stage that I'm at. Yeah. You know, the spirit of comparison mm -hmm. is alive. Yes. Because like you said, we are all on different journeys. Right. And even though we have the same end goal, yeah. the journey looks different. Yeah. It looks so different. And sometimes our paths, you, you know, somebody just have a straight path and the others be like, wait a minute, now why am I zigzagging? It, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And also even like appreciating, right? Like just, I, I've also had to learn how to appreciate timing. Everything that I have wanted to happen in my life, you know, like, and, and I know a lot of people who pray can, can relate to this. You are always thanking God for what did happen, but do we thank him for what didn't happen? Um, and, and, and didn't happen right when we wanted it to. There have been so many things that I can look back on in life that had it happened on my timeline when I had planned for it to happen, I either would not have been ready for, would not have had capacity for, would not have been accurately prepped for. And so for me to be able to appreciate, again, this sort of season of not being in school, of working, of, of, of taking things a little bit slower, you're like, I have to also appreciate that there is a divine timing that is happening here that my little brain can't necessarily comprehend. And that when it is finally time for me to make it to that next step of going back to law school, of going to an Ivy League, that it will be right when I'm ready for it right when I'm ready and prepared for it, when I have more things on my resume, you know, more things, more skills that I can add to my metaphorical toolbox. I'm learning so much on this job day to day, whether it's conflict management, learning how to work with different people from different backgrounds, learning how to be the youngest person in a space where I'm 22 and some of the people I'm working with could are as old as my mom and my dad. So like learning all these different skills that I didn't necessarily have just from being in school, appreciating the season that I'm in. That's where I'm at right now. Now, appreciating it and by appreciating outwardly I'm also appreciating internally as well what I did to be able to be here yeah so you said one of my favorite words which mm -hmm. is capacity because mm -hmm. yeah. we operate um outside of our capacity so mm -hmm. much sometimes and when you can recognize that you have a certain limit of capacity and you mm -hmm. need to work within that mm -hmm. then you will prevent burnout Right. And that spirit of comparison, um, failure mentality, like you just beating yourself up when yeah. you don't have the capacity for it. So I'm so happy you said that because I love to talk about that just in general. Mm -hmm. Like, do I have capacity for this? And I have to right. check myself like you don't. Right. You need to remove it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And, th and that in large part 
is why I am where I am, right? When I reached senior year, I was president of the Black Student Union. I was student government president. I was student trustee. I had two jobs on campus, one of which was working in our Office of Multicultural Student Affairs, doing ID&E work um, you know, and social justice work across campus. I was on homecoming. I was involved with tons of committees and task forces across campus. While my friends were going and tailgating at football games, I was sitting up in the president's box in suits um, or attending board meetings or attending conferences. So throughout all of undergrad, I was always more mature than what my age was. And so all that to be said, by the time I got to senior year, I was exhausted trying to just maintain everything, everything that I had signed myself up for, you know, to this, to this air of always having to be the big man on campus, always having to be the big man to everybody else, but recognizing that I had taken time to let my hair down, to enjoy myself, to have some fun, to take things slow. I had been going seven days a week for three and a half years, you know what I'm saying, up until graduation, because you know in college, you don't just stop on a Friday like you do in corporate America. It goes through weekends, it's events through weekends, it's hanging out through weekends, it's homework on weekends. Teachers don't care nothing about the fact that it's a Saturday. <laughs> so, and, and again, still had a scholarship to maintain and a certain GPA threshold that had to be met. So like all that to be said, all these different factors swirling around me for, for going on four years, that I was exhausted. So that's what led me to say, I can't go through because I don't have bandwidth to even be able to study for the LSAT. Something has to give. I hate it that that's what had to be given up. But like I said, it's so much, it's so, so the beauty and the divine timing of it all because I had to learn the lesson of slowing down. I say it all the time. I said, corporate America is slowing down for me. Going to work at a certain time and ending at a certain time and then just coming home and having all of this free time now on my hands, having to figure out what to do with myself. You know, we were talking about that before we hopped on, like making friends again, um, learning how to just be. Shoot, even giving myself the grace and permission to relax. That is something that does not get talked about, you know, as well, like not feeling like lazy because you're taking a, a day to just relax and get rest. Like those are all things that I had not built any skills for because I had always been in school, always forever more on the go since high school days. So there have been so many skills and, and lessons personally that I forcibly had to learn because I didn't have a darn choice. Um, and and I, like I said, I'm grateful for it because I have found balance in life. I'm reaching a point now where I'm finding balance in life. I've found ways to relax and I've I'm finding new hobbies. You know what I'm saying? I'm, you know, making new friends. I'm learning what it means to genuinely just slow down and take time to enjoy my relationship and be present and not always in a darn phone emailing while talking to other people or texting about what's coming next. Stopping focusing on what's coming next and just enjoying the present. So many lessons that are in that, that over this last year, just taking time just to learn. Okay. You, um, I'm telling you, you're ahead of the game. <laughs> Just because listening to you, it's like, I wish I would have slowed down yeah. some with things that I did. I yeah. um, built my company almost 16 years and I started going into my senior year of college. Yeah. And um, it just went from graduating, then from part-time straight to full-time. Yeah. And it's just been on the go. Yeah. And there's so many things that I think that I missed out on. Um, even dating because I traveled so much and yeah. I had a job where I was working yeah. six days a week, 12 to 14 hour days. I just did not have a balance and yeah. um, I'm playing catch up. So yeah. it's good that you recognize now the importance of self-care. I'm a huge self-care advocate. Yeah. I'm not doing a good job right now because I just started school, but <laughs> like I love my self-care days where yeah. I can just yeah. do nothing or join yeah. coffee on the patio yeah so it take is, a walk it is, get some fresh oh, air yeah, yeah like and not feel bad no i'm not being lazy i don't want to do anything i don't want to do anything and, and you beat yourself and i know you you beat yourself up about it like oh my gosh i'm being lazy i should be up doing something but i have stopped i have stopped tying productivity to me always doing work yes because productivity can also be you just taking time to move slow like taking a walk sitting around and watching some tv and having a glass of wine cooking for yourself or making something new that you've always wanted to try trying out you know a new hobby or just 
even taking it slow, like me and my girlfriend, our, our stuff, we'll just go to the grocery store together and walk up and down the aisles and look at different things and, and pick out stuff that maybe we want to get and try new. So like the little things that, again, I've stopped tying productivity to work. Being productive can also be, again, to that point of self-care and making sure that you're doing your wellness checks and making sure that everything is up to date. Even going to the doctor and the dentist, I just did like for the first time, like as an adult, about a month or some change ago, and I am very focused now on my overall, you know, physical care, making sure that the doctor check my blood and my heart and make sure I'm good and, you know, making sure my teeth are clean, like those kinds of things, like, you know, things that we, especially in the Black community, do not talk about, do not go over and, and really do not reflect on. I've been really adamantly focused about, especially in these last several months. Good. Yes, keep that grill clean. Yes, I always now got to gotta make sure the smile is dazzling. That's, that's you know, like it's the little things that make a difference. Yes. So you, you mentioned mm -hmm. always being mature. Mm -hmm. And that comes with a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. I feel like me personally, it felt like I had to carry so much. And there was just, just so high expectation. Where do you think that stems from for you? For me... It stems from this, it, it stems from a couple ideas, right? So, from, and this is a very unique experience for me. So, growing up, I have a dad who played professional football in the NFL, Lavernius Coles. He played for the Jets, the Cincinnati Bengals, and, and, and the, now the Washington team, but then formerly known as the Redskins. And so, all that to be said, coming up, it was always this idea as a Black man that I needed to play a sport or that I needed to go outside and be active and, and, and go be this person that I never was interested in being. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know how coming up the, the stereotypes related to gender. Got boys go outside and, and, and play sports and the girls sit, go sit in a room and you play with your dolls and your toys and you know how that kind of stuff goes. And so for me coming up, no one ever asked me what I was interested in. Nobody ever asked me if I had varied interests aside from physical activity, just because I was, uh, I've always been tall my entire life. I um, mean, I had a dad who played sports and I have an older brother who played sports. So for me, there was always just this expectation. And so when I finally got older and I kind of had more self-choice about what it is I chose to spend my time with, especially when I got to high school, that was really where I broke out of this shell. And there's all, I always have felt like I've had this chip on my shoulder, like I have something to prove. And most especially to my family, to show them that like there are so there are so many more ways than one to achieve success, to be successful. And so I've always busied myself in so many ways to be exceptional, to be more mature, to carry myself in this way, to prove to them that I not only can I do it, I can be successful and I don't have to ever pick up a ball if I don't want to. That's for one. For two, again, always being one of the few Black people in the spaces that I've occupied. I've attended primarily white schools my entire life, and now I work for a primarily white corporation. Being one of the only Black people, and typically more often than not, one of the only Black guys in the space, I have always had that chip on my shoulder to be exceptional, to be flawless, to do it well, to do it with style and grace, to be the best dressed, the best spoken, the best smelling in the space, no matter what it was. Every little detail has always been a thread that I intentionally weave to show that I am this person, that I am that person. And over the years, it has always, it's had its moments where it can just be so onerous and constantly just exhausting. Um, and, you know, I credit me getting into a, a happy adult relationship now with my girlfriend that has shown me that you don't always have to be that person to everyone that you can be vulnerable and that there's strength and vulnerability. You can focus and prioritize taking time for oneself. And that doesn't mean that you're gonna be behind this eight ball if you do, or that that's gonna derail whatever goals that you set, like going for the White House one day for yourself. That you can take time to, and I always, she always cracks jokes on me because I'm such a fast walker and that she, she met, you know, it's a metaphor to how I am in life. Everything has to be fast paced with me. It's I'm, I'm always moving quick. I'm always moving quickly, whether it's walking somewhere, hustling to the next thing, focused on what's coming next. So for me, I focus a lot on that in this last year, just slowing down some, 
not always having to be flawless, recognizing the strength and being vulnerable and sharing my story um, and recognizing that I can still be equally exceptional and equally myself without always having to put up this facade of I'm perfect and I'm flawless. So it's 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 been a great wait, but I also thank God too because he has given me the tools to be able to carry it so flawlessly at so many different moments. So even though it's heavy, I do wear it well and I am <laughs> exceptional at what I do. Can't nobody talk like how I talk. Can't nobody captivate like how I captivate. Can't nobody flip a switch and either be speaking in vernacular or speaking as proper as one comes. Can't nobody do it like me. And I recognize those gifts that he has given me that I'm so grateful for. So you know, it, that that is and a long-winded answer to, to that question of the heavy weight of always being this mature person. But I, I wear it well and I'm proud to wear it. Okay. Good. Good that you wear it well. And you also realize, hey, yeah. like it's okay to slow down too. Yeah. Um, yes. So that's important. And yes. what you're learning from your relationship to be right. vulnerable. You don't always have to, you know, have it perfect. Yes. Um, because, you know, so we're, we're, we're imperfect people, you know, Correct. striving Correct. to be perfect, right? But And it became a toxic tendency after a while because I never knew how to shut it off, even in my relationship. So mm -hmm. I'm putting up a facade now to my significant other while we're trying to get to know one another. And, you know, while she's being vulnerable, I am I have it all together. So in being in a relationship, it has shown me like, Landon, you have to learn how when to turn this off. Like there's, you've never had an off switch because even to family members, like I mentioned, I've always had it on for them. So learning to shut it off, learning to take off this mask that I wear and just, be me. Okay. So you, you mentioned family. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you've you been on your journey for about a year, right? Like mm -hmm. you're transitioning out of school and yep. you're learning who Landon is outside yep. of, you know, actually being attached to school. Yeah. What is that like for your family as you navigate through this season? How are they receiving it? Um, do they, you know, do they recognize it? Are there challenges? You know, I was, I was very, very scared of not their reaction. I think it was just more internalized about how people would perceive me not being in school and not being this guy, you know what I'm saying, not being this, the man. And I have come to find that my parents have more pride in me now than ever before, just doing what I'm doing. Um, moving up here by ourselves, we had no co-signers. So again, this is at age 22. We moved on our own with our own money. We moved up here. We had saved jointly over the last one. We saved about $13,000. We moved up here. We got our own realtor. We got our apartment by ourselves. Pretty much most of the furniture in here we've gotten by ourselves. We pay all of our own bills. Like this, this sort of independent self-sufficient stage of just even just adulting and being a self-sufficient adult who's happy in their lives, my parents are more proud of me than ever. And that has been the most validating part about this journey, just to see their faces. They have both had since a chance to come up here and visit my apartment. And I can tell you, there is no more prideful feeling in the world than to have your parents step in the space, the home that you created for yourself, by yourself for the first time, and just to see their face and say, son, I'm proud of you. Um, to have a family from afar who is exceptionally supportive. You know, like we've gotten some nice fun housewarming gifts, you know, and, and even more so it's fun now because I am now much more in tune with my family because I get it. Paying rent is ghetto. Um, <laughs> buying stuff for yourself is ghetto. Like this, like buying flights to go home and all these things now that I have to do for myself. So it's a, it's an even more unique understanding now as a young adult talking with my family because I get them and they get me even more so now because I get it, because I'm doing it. Going to work every day. I did taxes for the first time this year. Like those kinds of things that, that go into being an adult and we're able to laugh and joke about it and <laughs> poke fun and just, I, I'm really appreciative for where I'm at in life. They have been so, so, so supportive. And I have had parents, and I credit this to my parents, I've had parents that even though they might not have always understood my dream, because I can guarantee you, they probably don't even understand what the hell it is I do on a daily basis. They know, and have always been supportive, that no matter how far I want to go, it could have been across the world. I was talking about studying abroad at one point. 
no matter what my dream or goal has been, even if they didn't always understand it, they've always stood in line and stood in the paint, 10 toes down, no matter how far it is I wanted to go. So long as I had a plan and it was well thought out, you go, son, and you go be great. And for that, I am grateful and appreciative. And even more so, like I said, their pride has just reached the peak. Being able to come and stay with their son and their son being able to treat them out to nice things too, I think is also a good perk. And the discounts that I get through Estee Lauder, they appreciate that too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's so good to hear that yeah. you talked about like growing mm -hmm. up, you want to prove to them like there's so many things I can do without being physical or playing sports. Yeah. Like, and I can still be successful. Yeah. And then you now are in a different place than what you actually expected in life. And they are still so very proud of you. That has to feel good that yep. even the things that you were trying to prove, you're, you know, and this season's a little bit different and yeah. you still get that validation by them indeed. supporting you and still doing it your way because it's indeed. your journey. Indeed, indeed. Doing it my way, putting my stamp on it. And 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 finding and reaching a point now in life where even if I don't get validation from other people, I'm validating myself. And, and that is the most important part of it because you can get all the external validation in the world and still be unhappy on the inside. Um, so that for me has been key to just appreciate me, appreciate me, what I've accomplished, what I've made, and just enjoying every second of it. Because again, you don't ever get to be 22 again. Um, so enjoying this youth that I have, enjoying this place that I'm in, trying new things. I've been open. Like I was telling you, I gave up my car when I moved here. I take the train fully now. Um, I'm, I walk in New York and saying we try new restaurants all the time and just, living life and enjoying an experiment. And so I'm, I'm, I'm having a blast. I, I cannot complain and we are blessed. So this is all a part of it. And, and I'm every day I get up, I am just praying that wherever God may take me next, that I have the capacity for it and that the skills that I'm honing now will be, will be what I need to get me there and to keep me there. Yeah. So as a, a young adult, mm -hmm. like, yeah, Mm -hmm. um, I think it's so important that you are doing some of the inner work and recognizing things that are important to you specifically mm -hmm. and not what society says should dictate how you live your life. Yeah. What, how do you, what do you say to other maybe young adult like mm -hmm. me and your age or older who are kind of struggling with tapping into who they really are and mm -hmm. doing that inner work? Because I feel like in our community, um, we don't talk about it enough, but it's usually more black women who start the journey and black men are hesitant. Definitely. Um, there are so many lessons that go into that. Um, for one, the first thing that I have to say is, is that with black men, it starts with self-validation and finding self-worth and recognizing that whatever you may be feeling, it is valid. You know, I was telling my girlfriend, I said, this is this is a contra this might be a controversial opinion, but I think that the tropes that we oftentimes have both in society between the dynamics between men and women and especially in the black community between men and uh, men and women um, get played into by everybody, including black women, whereby we are oftentimes raised and I was raised by mostly women. We are raised to be tough and strong and always hard and and men have to be rock solid and that's what a man is and that's what a man does but then when the man gets older we have no skills whatsoever for emotional processing or recognizing that we are feeling something you know what I'm saying or that we are depressed or sad or not well or that we don't even know how to communicate outside of just communicating when we're angry so for me when I kind of started getting older, there was sort of a self-awareness of, you know, like, again, men go outside and you play with that football and all that, you know, emotional stuff. You know, anybody care about all none of that. You go out there and you play and you do what a boy's supposed to do. But recognizing that as a man, I can also be softer, too, and still be a man. Um, and so all that to be said, and again, being in a relationship and having good friends you like, I have really been deep in that journey, recognizing that my feelings and emotions are valid, that when I'm sad about something or when I'm mad about something, I don't have to push and squish that down because me expressing that makes me any less of a man or makes me any less validated because I'm saying that I'm sad or upset about something. So that was step one for me, recognizing that my feelings and emotions are valid. For the second component of it was 
learning how to express myself, learning how to express those things again, being mad and being angry and 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 going off at the mouth and, and cussing people out, that's not properly expressing yourself. Learning how to express yourself and communicate in, in those moments where you're sad and saying what's bothering you and being able to accurately diagnose things and being able to listen to your heart about when something's bothering you, that was sort of like step number two. And then step number three was being willing to say, you know what, there ain't nothing wrong with therapy. Um, you don't have, there doesn't have to be anything inherently wrong with you in order for you to seek out help, therapy, counsel, support, whether that's through the church or, or, or professional. Um, and so I started that recently, you know, right? Like I, I had my first ever therapy consultation and therapy appointment and don't get me wrong. It was different. Don't get me wrong. It, it, it was different for me, you know, just sitting there talking about me and what I feel and feel it's, it was, it was very different, but it was a good kind of different and it was a necessary kind of different for the season again that I'm heading into. Um, and, and I have come to appreciate it too, because in order to be able to enter great halls of authority and power and to be able to grow, some of the greatest people that we know, like the Barack Obamas, our spiritual leaders, you know, like they have therapists, they seek counsel, they, you know, express themselves to others and lean on other people when they're going through and wearing all these heavy things as the leaders of the world. Um, and so all that be said, I've come to have an appreciation for that. So, you know, like, again, another long-winded answer to say it's a step-by-step -step process. It's gradual. But to all Black men out there, get yourself well. Because by in you getting well, you're also able to help others be well, too. Um, you know, I found that, that when you can't be the leader of a family or the leader of a household and be blind yourself, you can't think that you're going to be able to lead a woman or lead children or raise a family or guide friends and be able to be accurate counsel if you yourself are blind to your own toxic tendencies and your own ways about yourself. So for me, I've been unpacking a lot of that. One of the things that like I just actually had happened just last night, um, last year, I lost a, a really good friend, a good friendship. And I was, I had been, had a calling on my heart. And I had been smushing it and pushing it down and refusing to listen, refusing to acknowledge it. And finally, you know, somebody else, they had just said, be obedient and listen to yourself and hear yourself and hear what God is calling you to do. And I reached out to that friend and we actually had a two hour phone conversation last night where we had a misunderstanding, which are a, a seemingly simple one that led to our great friendship sort of falling off. And I was, a, we were able to sort of reconnect after a year of not speaking um, and, and just, I was able to genuinely say how I handled those things were, was toxic of me. I shut down and shut you out because when I got upset, I didn't know how to process those feelings and emotions. Then I didn't want to hear what you had to say because I was so angry. Um, I warped and twisted a lot of the situation and made myself the victim because I was that angry. And I apologize to you for that because while we both contributed to why the friendship fell off. I was the one who ultimately stabbed it and killed it because I was in my own head so much. And again, didn't know how to process anger and being upset and recognizing that something that you had said had hurt me. So, and being willing to be vulnerable in that. So that was just actually a major milestone, a major development that I had happen last night. Um, just where I'm like on this, a part of this journey is being able to say I was wrong and I'm sorry and I am not flawless and I'm not perfect to that idea of it and being able again to soak in that vulnerability. You know, that is, um, you, you dropped some, a lot of really good nuggets. Yeah. Um, just about the three steps because I am started therapy about three years ago, um, ended up taking a break and mm. then, so it's been about two and a half years since I've actually, actually spent time in therapy and it yeah. has been life changing Yeah. because there are so many things that I just was not tapping into and understanding why I responded you know, some behaviors. And yeah. to your point, therapy doesn't mean that something's wrong with you. It is truly to help you become a better version of who you are, Correct. whatever that looks like. And you may have some things that you really do need to tap into from childhood as an adult. It could be current that you don't realize is holding you back. And a therapist can really, really help you, you know, just really make a difference. Right. And I know in our community, we're talking about it more. But, yeah. you know, you hear us talking about it more, but, you know, as I interact with some, some black men, sometimes there's this hesitation 
to communicate. And I'm like, we need, like you said, we need you all to lead. Yeah. And it will help you get over whatever those hurdles are or the challenges or limiting beliefs that you may have. Right. Maybe you were raised where you had to be tough and you can't express right. yourself. They can create that safe space for you. Yeah. To let it out. They really well, can. Well, and I'm also going to challenge that too. And this is something I learned at undergrad. I don't believe in safe spaces. No spaces. Mm. Are there are no such thing as safe spaces because no matter who it could be, there's always somebody that can hurt you in that space. I okay. have, am a firm believer in brave spaces, choosing to be brave in a space because you're my God sister and I trust you and you trust me. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't hurt each other in this so-called safe space. Therapists cannot be right for you in that so-called safe space. And there might be a mismatch of a therapist who might be guiding you in the wrong way or, or misadvising you. It happens in the church all the time where you have spiritual leaders who take advantage of their perch and position. So for me, there's no such thing as a safe space. Anybody can hurt you. It could be family, friends alike, but you can choose to be brave in those spaces and choose to be vulnerable and see that being vulnerable is bravery. So that for me, I had to flip my mindset on that in terms of I'm going to be brave in this space. I'm going to choose to be brave with this person and trust that this is going to be for my good and that this is going to work out for better. So brave spaces, not safe spaces. You know, I like that you said that too, because mm -hmm. it also is a recognition for us that we can't control other people. Correct. Right. So by you putting yourself in a space where you can be vulnerable and right. share your story, you can only hope for the best and know your intentions and what Correct. you, I can't say you don't, you know what your outcome is because you, right. you may not, but you're putting yourself in a position where you're talking about things that you are uncomfortable speaking. Exactly. And exactly. we can't control what someone else may do. Exactly. Um, so that's a, I'm going to have to, I'm going to steal that. Okay. Brave We're going to be space. using it. The brave yeah. spaces I'm and having that, that courage to yes. be able to tell your story. Exactly. Um, so I, exactly. I love that. You also talked about communication. Mm -hmm. And I think communi effective uh, communication cool. is so important. And I've had to learn that, you know, there are things that I do when I am not happy or mm -hmm. I have a disagreement. And I'm a person who, I don't say I shut down, but I'm very open about, hey, you know what? I, I, I don't, I'm not ready to tackle this. So yeah. I may need a couple of days. And yeah. to therapy, I learned that can be considered like, being you know, like manipulating situations yeah. and and yeah. i'm like really even if mm -hmm. i'm being open and honest at the beginning of whatever that relationship is like mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. it could be so you do learn like the importance of communicating and yeah. why you respond the way you do and mm -hmm. some of it could come from childhood interactions from your parent with your parents and how they responded to you the biggest thing that i found that most people in this lifetime are guilty of we all think that other people are supposed to be mind readers that folks are supposed to just automatically get what we think is a bad thing. You know what I'm saying? Every individual on planet Earth has grown up with their own biases and predispositions, their own sets of belief, their own understanding that is informed by their experiences in life. And all of our experiences are different and unique. The same way that you can grow up in the household with your sibling and come out to be two totally different people because your experiences are different. So all that to be said, we can sit around and it happens with friends and relationships with family members, with coworkers. Somebody will do something to us and we think that that is the worst thing that they could have ever done to us and just expect them to automatically get that they should not have done that when they have lived totally different than we have and may not understand that and aren't mind readers to be able to get why we are so upset. So to that vein of communication, one of the biggest things that I've had to let go is Lenny, you can't be mad at somebody when you didn't set up a proper boundary to begin with. You can't be pissed off with somebody and be cussing them out behind the scenes when you never stepped to them and told them directly and up front what is making you upset. That's actually what led to the demise of our friendship, that friendship that I was just talking about last night, where we both expected the other to get why we were so upset and so peeved about something that the other person did, but we never had a conversation about proper boundaries. And we never even set up that expectation that what that person said was going to bother us. So when it comes to communication, that is my biggest encouragement. Let go of your biases and also be willing to step in somebody else's shoes and say, well, huh, maybe they really aren't getting it. And ask yourself the question, what did you contribute to it? Because no matter what happens in any situation, it always takes at least two to tango. Nobody is ever purely innocent in any situation that goes down, especially when it comes to communication. So ask yourself the question, did you accurately communicate with that person 
Did you set up expectations and boundaries with that person? Um, you know, and, and that's something that I, I think is really important that we all have to ask ourselves, what did I contribute to the situation and how is it that I can communicate better on the next go round? And that is something that I have learned a lot over this last year, especially being in a relationship with a person who is very different than me, where sometimes you get pissed off, you know, when you be in the house and they do something that get on your nerves, it could be something as simple as the dishes, where they set something at in the house, something they do. And you just think they're supposed to get it. So you walk around all quiet with your face balled up, pissed off because you think that that person's supposed to understand. Meanwhile, they're looking at you like, what's wrong with you? And who pissed in your morning cereal? So <laughs> like all that to be said, that is something I have learned a lot about over this last year is just taking away that idea of expectation and recognizing everybody is different than you and being and over communicating rather than under communicating. Yeah. And you're right about boundaries. You know, we, even with relationships with parents or mm -hmm. siblings, you never set a boundary. You can't be upset, you know, if yeah. somebody does something or when it happens, if you don't express yeah. in the moment, hey, yeah. I don't like the way that made me feel or this is something I don't, a conversation I don't want to be a part of. You know, yeah. you can't be upset with that individual if you never express like what that your boundaries part. are. That part. And I was just talking about that with my dad when he came into town the other evening. He said, he dropped this nugget and I know I just want, I have to say it. He said, I don't create barriers, but I do have boundaries. And when he said that, I was like, Phew. I don't create barriers, but I do have boundaries. And it was super, super powerful to me because it's this idea of when you are in a, a friendship or a relationship that is not meant for you, when you set up boundaries, those who are not for you will view them as barriers. But when you are in a relationship with someone, in community with someone, who values you, who cares enough about you, setting up a proper boundary will never be viewed as a barrier. It will be viewed as just that, a healthy boundary to maintain a healthy relationship. And that all goes into the communication. And that all goes into self-love and self-care. It's all one big conversation. It's all components of self-love and self-care. If you don't have boundaries, that means you are not caring for yourself. Whether it's setting up boundaries about what are your triggers, What's not appropriate for you to say? I have plenty of boundaries because I love me some me. You're not about to talk to me any kind of way because I don't do that to other people. You're not about to curse at me. You're not about to raise your voice at me. You're not about to come at me sideways like you're trying to get physical because I'm about it too. You know, <laughs> there are so many different things that we are not about to do because I love me some me. And I love me more every single day. And the more that I love myself, the more boundaries I do set up in my relationship and even more so the one thing that i've come to learn too is that typically when we think of boundaries we only think of them when you're in a romantic relationship you need boundaries and friendships too yes you need boundaries with family too so that has all been a part of the journey over this last year recognizing that yeah landy you have a best friend and they're your best friend you might not you're not romantic with them but you still need to let them know what it is and what it ain't same thing goes with mom and dad and siblings you're not just about to dip into my life and come and ask me for something just when you need it. And then when I reach out to you just to talk to you, you ain't never there. Yeah. So all those things that go into it, it's all a big roundabout way of saying these are all the different pillars of how I've been focusing on loving me, learning to set up boundaries, learning to over communicate, learning to stop assuming because what do they old folks say about assuming to assume makes an ass out of you and me learning to I'm saying appreciate where it is that I am in life and appreciate the the contributions that I bring to the table and the home that I have and the job that I have and appreciate and stop comparing myself they're all different pillars of it there's no one set way to get there it's a million and one different ways to do it and that's been a part of my journey yeah and it's, it's one thing that as you're talking about mm -hmm what you have gone through as far as boundaries and loving yourself. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to also highlight that when we do the work, we can yeah. receive and reciprocate so much more. Mm -hmm. So you're going through your journey. I'm going through my journey. Right. There's different experiences, but I can be more open and receptive to your right. boundaries and, you know, the things that you need and right. the things that I need. And when we don't focus on ourselves and yeah. make self-love a priority in healing. Yeah. We can lose relationships when people are on, are really focused on ourselves because we don't understand and we'll never understand. Yeah. And some people can learn from you. My, I know yeah. my mom, my sister, I had to set some boundaries in place. 
Hello. And I had to remind them. Hello. And, and sometimes you do have to remind them. Remind them. them. But yes. you know what? My mom has been open to say like, you know, I've learned so much from you through your journey and mm -hmm. the boundaries and things that I set. It's not my responsibility, right, to teach her. Right. But when others go on that journey too, I mean, you can, their, your relationships will be so much more healthier in all relationships, not just romantic partners. E exactly, exactly. And then also too, like I said, sometimes you actualizing your self-care and self-love journey will help other people along the way as well. Absolutely. And I've also come to realize too, this is also a dangerous mindset that I've seen a lot of people get into. They think that once you start therapy, I'm healed, I'm fixed. I love me some me, and so I'm 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 good now. I'm healed, and I'm 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 great. Self love and self care. It's a journey, not a fixed point. It does not end. It is lifelong. There's mm -hmm. never a age or a place that you can reach. Whether it's the amount of money that you make or the amount of peace that you might feel, it is something that you have to actively, never passively work on. And so I have seen a lot of people before who kind of get into this holier than thou mindset because they have reached this fixed point, this promised land that they think that you get once you start therapy and you got a couple tools underneath your belt to deal with anger now and you feel a little bit better than what you did. No, you, you, you have to keep going. And that's something that I myself can fall into sometimes where you're like, there's nothing wrong with me now, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know, so I say all that to say, like, I am also focused on it being continuous and not getting lazy because you get better. The same way that when you get sick with the flu or a common cold, you can't stop taking care of yourself once you get over the cold. You have to keep taking your vitamins and working out and getting fresh air and exercising and making sure you're doing all the things to keep your immune system up so you don't get sick again. But then there's never such a fixed point as you being too healthy. The same thing goes for your mental and your emotional and your spiritual. It's a journey. It's lifelong. You never stop. And so I always call myself, I am forever more student. So even though, yeah, I graduated and I have my degree, I'm always learning. You're never supposed to stop learning. That's why I don't believe in experts. Because anybody who says themselves to be an expert kind of almost indicates that maybe you've reached this promised land of knowledge and information, but there's always more to be gained and more to be learned. And we learn more every single day. So that's where I'm at. It's a journey. It's continuous. You're absolutely right. And I still have my toxic tendencies too. So <laughs> folks who are watching this who think, damn, he got it together for 20. No, nah, I don't get it twisted because your boy still has his <laughs> that you easily fall into when pushed there or sometimes without even being prompted to. So, and it's being able to recognize that, that makes you stronger. Yes. And that's why it's a journey. Like right. we're, we're, you will never be healed. Right. Because right. it's going to be triggers that yeah. are going to happen. You're going to have traumas every day. New traumas. Yeah. Somebody's going to cross that boundary and Correct. you're like, hold on now. Hold on now. <laughs> don't, don't get it twisted. I ain't always been saved. This is, yes. it, it was a me before. <laughs> it was a me before. Y'all don't want you to have to bring them back out now. So I. I definitely am with you on that one. It is the journey. It is the it journey. It is. So, but Landon, oh my gosh. So, you know, let me tell you something. I'm just so proud of you and impressed. I am, you know, when I think about the things I wish I would have known younger, mm -hmm. even in my early 30s, mm -hmm. like you are doing the work now. And mm -hmm. when I say you're so ahead of the game, it's just that you're going to make an impact on the next generation based on the way you not carry yourself professionally. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, when you make it to the White House, mm -hmm. it's all the things that people don't get to see, like, behind closed doors, when they're yeah. home with you in the apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, because there is greatness ahead of you. Right. But those are the things that we have to show the next generation that it's okay to be vulnerable and have conversations and to cry, mm -hmm. um, to go to therapy. So I am so proud of you, the work that you're doing, because at your age, you don't hear a lot of people talking about it. And I hope that you really are inspiring your girlfriend and others around you to do the mm -hmm. same. It takes a lot to not go straight to law school because mm -hmm. some people feel like you have to. Straight through. And then I met so many people who I'm like, why are you 35 and partying every weekend? Because they went so hard. They're trying mm -hmm. to catch up right. on the slowing down piece exactly. and things they missed out on. Exactly. So 
it's great that you're doing what you're doing. Exactly. It really is. It's, it's going to help you in the long run. Definitely. But is there anything that you would like to say to anyone out there that, um, you know, haven't started their journey, but know that they need to, or maybe in, in a similar situation as you, like took a break from school, yeah. trying to figure out this new season, not the, that wasn't a plan. Any advice? Yeah. You know, there is a quote that I love and it was, it, it, it's, it's really powerful to me. And I can never remember who said it, but I always remember by heart for it to be so long. And it goes, we can judge our progress by the courage of our questions and the depth of our answers and our willingness to embrace what is true rather than what feels good. And when you dissect that quote in the three sections that it comes in, by the courage of our questions, being willing to ask yourself difficult questions. So to anyone out there who is watching this who has not started your journey, ask yourself why. Ask yourself, how are you feeling? Ask yourself, what are you hiding behind your smile and your eyes every single day that you get up and try to put on a facade for other people? Ask yourself the courageous questions, the brave questions, like what we talked about earlier in this conversation. Then when you go to the second part of that quote, the death of your answers, thinking about, the depth of your answers, and are you in tune with self? So when you ask yourself those hard questions, do you have an answer? If you don't, what does that say? If you have an answer, how deep and in tune does it really go? And are you really acknowledging what the true issues are at heart? And all those things can then lead you to this idea of the willingness to embrace what is true rather than what feels good. So thriving and being willing to soak and sit in uncomfortability, which is what is the precursor to all growth. The idea that when you don't have that answer and when you have this uncomfortable question, are you willing to sit in that, to soak in that, to absorb that, to be one with that, to recognize that all of those things are what makes you, you, and to appreciate that and then grow from that. And that for me is how you judge progress. That's how you push forward. So ask yourself uncomfortable questions. You know, when you go to bed at night, everybody kind of sits there and your brain is just going over everything from the day, from the week, what's happening tomorrow. Sit there with yourself and ask yourself some tough and uncomfortable questions. Recognize where you're at with your answers and then be willing, again, to embrace the truth of, I need help. I need a friend. I need counsel. I might need spiritual guidance. I might just need to get up and go take a walk and get some fresh air. And that to me is progress. So all that to be said, that is a quote that I can leave people with that I hope in some way, shapes or form at least gets you to start your journey. Yeah. Well, thank you, Landon, for joining me. It has been a great conversation. Yes, it has. Um, I learned a lot from you, you know, um, just some wisdom and gems that you dropped about what you're doing in your journey and what you've learned. Mm -hmm. um, because this conversation is just is, is both ways. Um, it streets. goes both ways too, for sure. So I, I just hope that someone is inspired by your story and, and want to start, you know, and, and it takes the leap to do that um, based on our, our conversation today. So I appreciate you. And I thank you so much for, for being on a reach, living a rich legacy with me. Thank you. Thank you for having me.